Well, welcome to church. I'm so glad to be here with you today, and uh, I'm just super excited about the message that I get to bring to you guys. And uh, man, I hope you guys had a good week. Yesterday, I got to ride a motorcycle for the first time in my life. I've never done that. And uh, you know, I woke up and it was like 60 degrees. I thought, surely shorts and flip-flops should be fine. I'll just wear a jacket on top of it. And uh, it turns out that the wind chill at 60 miles an hour is really bad at 60 degrees. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was cold, you know, it was cold. But I was grateful to ride um, with Rob Edinger. He has a bike that is amazing. We had an awesome experience. We had 48 people show up or 48 bikes show up for that. And uh, man, it was just really cool to tour around. And I understand motorcycling now. So uh, anyway, you missed it if you missed it. But um, so good. To be here with you, everybody online. Uh, I want to welcome you, and you know, for those of you who've been consistent through this whole thing, and you haven't like listened in your shop while you're fishing and you know polishing your car and stuff at the same time. Um, I just want to say thank you for being consistent, thank you for joining us, and thank you for doing this. And I wanted to invite you to come back. Um, we are at this place now. We're, um, we're in phase five. Governor Hoka moves us to phase five. That was like a surprise party this week. It was like, oh, wow, that's great. And uh, Indiana has really, really good numbers COVID-wise. Nationally, um, we're actually doing really well. And uh, we're not the worst anymore. It turns out that Europe has had a huge resurgence and France and all these other places are doing bad. And the United States is doing great. Can you believe it? Like we're doing something good. I know. You wouldn't believe it by hearing the news, but the numbers are real, and so that's really cool, and um, we're still going to continue to be cautious as far as having, you know, our seats and our rows that are spaced farther apart, just out of respect for you guys, and uh, we're going to continue to um, gauge the situation. At some point, we'll begin to move them back, assuming that things continue to head in a good direction and whatnot, and mask-wise, we're going to continue to honor that mandate until Governor Holcomb releases us from that, but uh, we're kicking off this brand new series called Warrior. And, uh, oh, I forgot to say welcome to the Jasper County Jail Campus. Not forgotten. Loved. Hello. But uh, we're kicking off this brand new series called Warrior. And uh, I've been excited about this series all year. I put this on the calendar about a year ago. And uh, I just, I love this concept. Um, I love the idea of being gritty and strong and courageous. In life, I've noticed there's normal people. And then there's people with what I call a warrior spirit. And uh, warriors are more than people who are fighters who run their mouths off and start things and stir up trouble. Uh, that's not what I want to talk about. Technically, a warrior is a soldier who is brave and experienced and has shown valor in um, great pressure in warfare. And uh, it's someone who's been there and back again and has a deep inner resolve to continue fighting for a great cause. A warrior spirit to me is someone who has built a great life and made it to safety financially, emotionally, and relationally, uh, but then has the deep inner resolve that drives them to continue. And I think of great warriors in our society. I think of like Warren Buffett, Mother Teresa, Douglas MacArthur, Elon Musk, and Billy Graham. These are gritty people who made it in life before they were old, but they kept going to the very end. A warrior has an inner spirit that drives them. They're not quitters. It's not about accolades. It's not about money. It's about something deeper. It's a determined, unrelenting, never give up, never quit spirit that never retires. A warrior is not driven by the normal things that drive most people. It's not about competition and fear. It's about conviction and faithfulness. That's what drives a warrior. A warrior is who I want to be in life. They're who we admire. They're who build and shape our world. Warriors are the 10% of people who produce 90% of our economic output. And that's kind of remarkable that 10% of people produce 90% of our economic output. But if you want to learn how to become one, you're going to want to tune into this series. Uh, we're going to look at the most influential warrior in human history, Jesus Christ, along with several others in the Bible, and we're going to learn their secrets. Even if you're not a Christian, I think you're going to be blessed by this series. And uh, if you're an Enneagram type 8 control freak like me, you're going to want to know what's going to happen. So I'm going to show you an overview of what's to come. So this week, we're talking about an overview. You. This is called an appetizer. This is chips and salsa. Okay, this whole week is just chips and salsa. We're just doing the sampler platter with the wings and everything else. Next week is when we get into it. Next week is when you want to come back for the main course. Okay, so just telling you, plan on that. Um, next week, I'm talking about bringing the team with you. Sometimes I look at my family and I think we're really failing as a unit right now. We look bad together. We need to get this together. Next week is all about bringing your kids and your wife and your grandkids and your family with you on a vision, on a journey to embrace a warrior spirit. It's about raising strong, gritty families full of conviction and inner resolve. And if that sounds good to you, don't miss next week. Week three is called Do It Afraid. It's all about managing your fear and continuing to show valor and courage in the face of fear. And then lastly, we're going to talk about seeing the whole battlefield, which is like the most John Hill talk ever because I love vision and stuff. But this week, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to talk for a little bit about some points and some scripture. I'm going to leave you with some challenge and encouragement. I have a five-point message. I know some of you are like, dear God, five points. Can you get through it all? I promise you I can. It's going to be like short point, really long point, and then short, short, short. That's just the way it's going to go. So anyway, um, story. In my early 20s, I was dating this girl. 
And uh, she was a fine girl in a lot of ways. I, I will say that the problem was mostly with me, um, but we were a disaster together, a huge disaster. And uh, all my friends were like, this is the worst parent. You ever have friends where it's like, can you please just break up? Like, you are terrible together. This is so dysfunctional. And that was, all my friends told her that, all, or all her friends told her that, all my friends told me that. Um, it was totally my fault, though. I was so immature. I just had no vision and no clue. But I remember one thing that was her fault, and I love that. In this message, I'm going to, like, point out one thing that was her bad, even though it was mostly my fault, because that's what I do. I'm just asking my wife. But I remember um, she had had a childhood that was pretty free from consequence and discipline. And uh, in, she was spoiled. And in particular, she did not understand money on a large scale. Like she understood it on a small scale, but on a large scale, no clue. She paid for almost all of her private four-year college with student loans, which is crazy because like $100,000 in debt in a Spanish major, like, please, what are you going to do? Like, this is crazy, you know? And um, she would just buy things all the time and never work. You know what I mean? Like, let's go out to eat. Let's go to a concert. Let's do this. She was an Enneagram type seven. It was like, this is going to, what are we doing? She did study abroad, travel to Europe, summer break, you know, she would do all this, never work just racked it up and I was like this is and at one point we were in yet another argument you ever have relationships where that's all it is like it's just like yet another argument it's like why are we together why can't we break up like normal people but whatever okay and um I remember this is what she said she looks at me and she goes and this is what her voice sounded like in my memory uh I just don't understand why the government doesn't print more money and I was like wait what like wait what like, you actually wait what you don't understand money you know what I mean like you don't understand how this works like printing more money and not making things just makes pricing go up. Just ask people who are in the construction trade who are buying lumber right now, um, right? But what she didn't understand because she was so affluent and isolated from struggle as a child is that all of this life is a battle to live, right? That's why we work, to not die, to not starve. That's what we have to do. And we're so isolated because we live in such a prosperous country. You know, we're, we're isolated from that danger, but we're not fighting against people. We're fighting against an environment that wants to kill you, right? And for almost all of human history, that was a very imminent struggle today. Not so much, but that's generally the financial battle that we're in. And I think the most common mistake that people make personally on a financial level is they forget slash never know that we are in this financial battle and we're fighting to win. And I think a lot of people just don't fight. And what happens is their finances get ravished. By the time they're 30, it's like, man, you got a long way to go. You buy things you can't afford, and you don't fight for a future that you must win it. And um, I remember with this lady in my life, it was like, uh, hello, hello, what, what are you doing? $100,000 of debt in a Spanish major, like your host. Like you're just, what are we gonna do? You gotta start fighting for your future. And you're not living a life that is doing that. You're just literally destroying your future. And to this woman, I just kept saying, you're a warrior, you know, because college is not a time to party. It's a time to prepare for the fight for your life. That's what we're doing, right? Your early 20s, that's what you do. It's not a time to party. It's a time to prepare. And in almost exactly the same way, I think most Christians forget that we are in a spiritual battle, right? And this life is not a time to party. It's a time to prepare and fight for our eternity, and I think the big problem, it's not evidence, right? I mean, at this point, um, I think we've seen enough evidence. For me in particular, I know some of you are on a search, but for me in particular, to walk away from my faith, I would have to choose complete, abject, intentional ignorance. Like, we, I'm not superstitious. I know that something can't come from nothing. I know that we live in an intelligently designed, finely tuned universe. I can't deny God's existence. The God of the Bible is real, right? Um, but, but I think what happens is so many of us know that. It's just we forget that we're in a battle for eternity, Right? And um, I think a lot of us, specifically because America is so prosperous, is we forget that we're all going to die. And I know that that sounds harsh, but like, um, let me give you an example. Like, uh, I got a, a lady friend of mine from years ago who had like a zombie apocalypse cat. And what I mean by that is this cat was like 22 years old, right? I mean, it's like a squillion years old. It's like the Methuselah of cats. It's lived forever. And um, the thing finally died. And she was like, <gasps> I never saw this coming. And I was like, I have empathy for your cat. I mean, I build a house to keep animals out, not to let them in, but whatever. I have empathy for your cat and your loss and whatever, I'm sorry. But like, really, you didn't see it coming? Like, I saw it coming, you know what I mean? Like, the cat was a squillion years old. It was gonna die, you know? Another friend of mine, years ago, her great-grandmother died, right? And again, compassion, empathy. But, but her great-grandmother was literally 97 years old, and uh, I didn't see it coming. And it was like, What? Like, what do you mean? The over-under on next month? I mean, ripe bananas was a gamble. Like, what are you doing? 97? For real? Come on! You know, I didn't see it coming. And it's like, all of us forget that we're gonna die. Like, I just want us to know, like, this is a thing. Like, we're all gonna die. And yet, in America, we're so isolated from it. It's just not a risk that we think of all the time. And yet, this is a risk that is pretty much 100% imminent for every man, woman, and child in the world. 
But what happens, instead of building the character and discipline of Christ in our lives, we keep falling into these traps spiritually because we, we fail to take land for the kingdom because we forget that we're in a spiritual battle. We literally just give land to the enemy. And this is what we do. We say, well, it's fine. God wins in the end, and this is so much fun right now. And you know what I'll do is I'll just ask God for forgiveness. And the problem with this is, um, number one, like, we're squandering God's gift. Number two, we miss out on our purpose. And, like, here's the thing. Living a life where we constantly lose spiritual battles is profoundly unsatisfying. And wonder of wonders, if you don't live a life that is satisfying spiritually, you're going to have a very unsatisfied spirit. You know what I mean? You might have everything that you want in life. It might feel like generally good on the outside, but deep in your heart, it's just really empty. And I think that's the real pandemic of today. Like that's the real pandemic in America. I mean, COVID, come on. Like most of us have a really good life. Like how many of us have, you know, lost a ton of people in our lives over this? And, you know, maybe we lost a little bit of money. Um, maybe we lost a little bit of free, but really none of us are starving. Like our lives are really, really good on a, on a global level, like really good in a, in a historic level, really good. But for so many of us, we have this unsatisfied spirit. And so what do we do? We point out problems. We find all kinds of things to be worried about that aren't real, but they're real to us because we're looking for problems. And I just want to remind you, sometimes I look at our choices and it's like, hello, what are we doing? What are we doing? And that brings me to my first point. We are in a spiritual battle. So often I think we forget this, but Paul says in his great letter to the church in Ephesus, he says, a final word. Okay, if I leave you with one thing, I want you to know this. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against the strategies of who? The devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. So many people say, but John, it's, it's the Republicans. It's the Democrats. It's the, you got to, no, no, that's not the enemy. Like, yes, I disagree with some of those and I disagree with this and that, but like the, the primary enemy is Satan. It's against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. I just think it's interesting how, so, how we so easily forget that we're in a spiritual battle. And it seems to me like, and this is the big problem, and this is partially my fault, you know, I think a lot of pastors do this, but I think somehow we've allowed the church to get reduced into this like giant self-help podcast book thing. You know what I mean? Like you come to church and it's like seven secrets to a godly better marriage. Five tips to overcoming unforgiveness or whatever. Five, your best life now. That's what you're, and I'm not saying that you don't get that benefit. I'm not saying that following Jesus won't bless your life. I mean, God understands us and his plan does lead to human prosperity and, and a good life and a good society and it's good, but that's a sideshow. The primary reason we come to church is we're in a spiritual battle to be reconciled to a holy, righteous, just, perfect, true, living, eternal God. And Jesus Christ and his grace is the only way to overcome that. And Satan fights us from discovering that. And Paul is saying, hey, 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 remember, we're in a spiritual battle, y'all. Like, don't forget, you must remember, this is the challenge of our life. It's spiritual and it's serious. Everything is spiritual. And that's so helpful for me. The people that I talk to, I'm like, oh man, this is, there's an eternal spirit inside of this person, right? The relationships, who I am, the sexual choices that I make, I just remember, this is a spiritual thing. This is a big deal. Point number two, um, Satan is the enemy. Satan is the enemy, this is a big deal for some of us. We've been talking about this for weeks, who the enemy really is. John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. Make no mistake about, about it. Satan really, there's, there's no good. He wants to destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Sometimes I hear people ask me, they say, uh, Pastor, why, um, why, why, does, why does God, or why does Satan really want to destroy our lives? Like, why is he so mean? And I'll tell you this, Satan hates God. God loves us. So Satan wants to hurt God by hurting us. That's fundamentally it, right? And I know that that sounds crazy, but listen, every time I see someone demonically oppressed or we see societies turn from Jesus, we see this. And you might not believe in God, but you can see how humans apart from God throughout human history have consistently destroyed each other. I mean, we know empirically, we know that numerically and statistically the most destructive ideology and movement in human history has been atheism. It's been godlessness. We know this absolutely, and you don't need to be a Christian to see it. The data doesn't lie. I talked about this in detail last week. But um, then one of you emailed me about Chairman Mao, and I'll just give my correction. Last week, I wrongly said he killed 20 million of his own people as the first general secretary of the Chinese Politburo. That is incorrect. Thanks for the correction. He killed 50 million, 50 million of his own people. And I think that's kind of like remarkable that like we just kind of fly over that, right? We just fly over like this is what happens. Like, I mean, we're talking now about hundreds of millions of people who've been killed. Like the real pandemic in the world, I don't think is COVID. I think it's godlessness. Like it's worse than any communicable disease we have. 
It's interesting to see how God is a civilizing force that consistently dignifies human life. Listen, Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He uses a lot of different weapons against us. And I've shared before how he is the father of lies. But the Bible actually uses a number of different names for Satan. Another name that God uses for Satan is um, uh, the accuser. And uh, Satan has this great weapon that he uses against us called accusation. We see this all over society. Have you ever, Jody, have you ever had anyone accuse you of something? It doesn't feel good when it happens. Like somebody accuses, like my wife says, John, you're a liar. I'm like, huh? What? what? Right? You get accused and it's like, huh? You know, somebody comes to you and they say, you did this to me. You abused whatever. It's like, huh? It just, it is. It's like your gut drops when somebody does that. It's a serious thing. What's interesting is it's become a common thing today. Because as the teachings of Jesus recede from society, we embrace the language, the tools, and the habits of Satan with each other. An accusation is he should step down, she should resign, he's a disgrace, he's a this, they're unfit, they're unqualified, he's a liar, he's an abuser, she's a racist, he's a bigot, whatever, right? And this is what we see as the teachings of Jesus no longer prevail in American and Western society. What do we see? Accusation begin to thrive. Revelation 12.10 talks about this. It says, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. Okay, the accuser is the devil. Satan's thrown down to earth. This is what he does. The one who accuses them before our God day and night, all the time, day and night. Satan sends these little accusations to God and to us. And look, I believe for me, this has been Satan's most effective weapon. And I struggle with this intensely. Satan has had a foothold in my life over this. I'm overcoming it. But um, when I say I struggle with anxiety, like this is it. I struggle with anxiousness over the devil's accusations in my own mind. This is what usually happens for me when I'm at my worst. I'll, um, you know, be very calmly getting my kids in the car before school. Get in the car! Get in the car now! You know what I mean? Just calm and whatever. And, um, Then on the way, I'll just be filled with accusation, like, you're such a bad dad. What are you doing? What makes you think you can do this? You lost your temper again, and you're so stupid, like, you're never gonna have another sermon written, and you're just such an embarrassment, and why did you do this, and it's all gonna come crumbling down around you, and you started this thing, and you said this, and whatever, and you're never gonna be able to recover, and it's all gonna be a disaster, and he did it to you on purpose, and he knows how it hurt you, and you should never trust him again. Like, you can't trust him. You can't trust anybody, right? And you're just a failure, and you're gonna be alone, right? That's the voice of the accuser in my life, all the time. It happens. It's how he does it. It's accusation. Now, um, the devil's the accuser. I got a funny story because I know a lot of you probably don't relate to it in the same way that I do. Um, but I have a funny story that's going to help illustrate this in a way many of you will relate to. And uh, it's a long story, but it's going to make sense. So just bear with me. But I remember as a kid, oftentimes being mad at my mom and dad. Okay, just was. Um, and uh, to this day, I've never had my dad lose his temper at me or yell at me. My mom very rarely either. And my assumption, presumption, was that um, when you have kids, you just love them so much that you never get angry, right? That's what I assume. I'm going to have these kids. I've got a bad temper. But when I have kids, I'll just never lose my temper because I love them so much. This um, theory of mine turned out to be proved wildly wrong as soon as I had kids, like almost instantly. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever been so mad at a toddler, at one of your toddlers, that you actually wanted to, like, fight them? You know what I mean? Like, I'm, like, just so mad, Right? And I would never lay a hand on my kid in anger. I still have never done that. I'm not going to do it. It's not who I am, but, but, or not who I choose to be. But um, I've been so mad at some of my kids, I find myself like squaring up on them. Because here's the thing. Nobody can disrespect you like a toddler. A toddler will look at you in the face and they will run their mouth off at you and say all kinds of things. And literally, while they're looking at you, they'll be taking a dump and then they'll be like, change me. You know what I mean? And it's like, that's humiliating. There's nothing I can do about it. And I'll admit it. I'll admit it. I give my power away. You know, I let them get under my skin. Nobody can trash talk like a, like a toddler, right? And I give my power. I never laid a hand on my child. I, I, I never will, but I sure have lost my mind in my mind. And suddenly I understand my dad's like distant look. You know, he's never lost his temper at me, but he just gets that million mile stare where he's just thinking about things and taking that anger and squishing it down into a little box. And he's putting that box on the shelf to take out on the lawnmower later. Like, oh, this stupid lawnmower. It's like, where did that come from? It's like, yeah, I know. I know. You know what I mean? The other day, my two-year-old, Aurora, was getting some milk, okay? And now, to be clear, she didn't want milk until I got the milk out to pour it into my cereal. And she noticed that there wasn't that much milk left. And that little smart girl, she understands microeconomics. She understands supply and demands. And I know what she did. She comes up to me, and while I'm pouring the milk into my cereal, which I'd already gotten out and already put into the bowl, she's like, Daddy, milk. And I was like, listen, I've given life to you. And um, I am not, if you think you're going to sit here like an entitled millennial contributing nothing to this household while you deprive me of sleep and freedom and money and of going to the bathroom and privacy, you got another thing coming. I mean, if you think it's okay to just thug it up in here and take my milk from me, I ain't going to stand for that. So I took that milk and I looked right in her eye and I poured it into my cereal. How do you like me now? I poured it all out into the cereal, right? All out. And then I took it and I crushed it and I threw it in the trash. Was it selfish? Yeah. Maybe I was teaching her a lesson. You'll thank me when she's not an entitled millennial and says she'll just be in jail. But anyway, at this point, 
she squares up on me, right? She ain't mad. She's got, you know, a little bit of a fighter spirit, warrior spirit. She squares up on me, and she started to look at me with that real scary look in her eye. And I know, because everybody says she looks just like her mom. And at least you know that's true. She looks just like her mom. And I've seen her mom give me that look right before she kills me. So I know, she's mad. And uh, Aurora's verbal skills are not fully developed. So she looks at me with a bunch of gibberish at this time, and she said something like, milk daddy bad, right? And I want to be clear, she didn't actually say more than three intelligible words, but I knew what she said. I knew what she said. I could read her mind. She didn't have to say it. I knew what she said. She looked at me. She said, give me that milk, you little cross-eyed midget man. <laughs> and at this point, I lost my mind. I was like, Kristen, Kristen, did you hear what she said to me? Kristen, did you hear what she said to me? Get in here. She's like, calm down. Don't tell me to calm down. You calm down. You need to tell her to calm down, right? You're going to stand here in the house that I paid for. I didn't actually pay for it. My parents and I split it, but that's irrelevant. In the clothes that I purchased for you. I didn't, I've never bought her clothes. We just get hand-me-downs, but whatever. In the air that I conditioned for you, which is true because um, even though I'm cheap, Kristen's a cold-blooded reptile. I say, and you're going to talk to me like that. Now, um, to be clear, she didn't actually really talk to me about anything. She said like three words mixed with gibberish. She didn't actually say words. They're just the words I heard in my mind. And I heard the words, here's the reason, here's the reason. I heard those words because they're the words that I hear in my head every time I mess up. It's interesting how that triggers me. The accusation, it's not the voice of others. It's me assuming others believe about me the worst things that I already believe about myself. Have you ever been mad at someone before they said anything? Or inserted words into a conversation in your mind because you assumed that they were thinking it? Have you ever unleashed on your husband because he came home from work late? And you assume he doesn't love you and he doesn't see how hard you work and he doesn't value you. And maybe it's not those things at all. I mean, he's at work late because he loves you and because he values you and because he sees all that you do. It's not those things. It's just that you hear those things over and over again inside your mind. And him being late triggered those thoughts again. And it's not that he thinks that. It's that you think that. Because that's the voice of the accuser in your life. It amazes me how much of my life I've lost because I just listened to the, to the voice of the accuser inside of my own head. I've destroyed many of my own relationships I spent hours arguing with my wife. I missed out on job opportunities. And probably most tragically, I missed out on a huge portion of my very good life because I'm inside my head arguing with myself and hating myself and listening to these little fiery arrows in my mind and heart over and over and over again. I have a great life. I have a good life, but I miss out on so much. I can't be the father I want to be, the husband I want to be. I can't be the pastor I want to be. What I'm describing is really important because um, if you want to become a gritty, determined warrior, you've got to overcome the accusations that Satan throws at you. And, and, and for me, this is how he takes me out of the battle. And for some of you, it might not be an issue, but I know some of you, you came today to hear this because this is what you deal with. I think a lot of us are being taken out of the battle because we believe these accusations. Did God really say that we have to meet together? Is it really that big a deal if I take a few weeks off from following Jesus? I could never be accepted there. I could never lead that. I could never succeed at that. Is the spiritual world really that important? Is it really that necessary? Is it... Zechariah tells a story of this guy who's doing a great work for God. And I want you to see how Satan attacks him in Zechariah 3, verse 1. It says, Then the angel showed me Jeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, right? In the spiritual vision, this is what it looks like. The accuser, the accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Jeshua. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. And here's my big thought. Satan is the enemy and he gets you with accusation. But I want you to know that for all those who belong to Christ Jesus, those accusations are rejected. And there might be some of us here today who need to say, you know what? Jesus has already rejected those accusations, so I do too. And I don't need to listen to him anymore. Maybe it's time for us to say God is a judge. And in Christ, Satan's accusations are done. They have no place here. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a son of the king. Maybe that's it. Maybe there's some of us who are letting Satan's accusations destroy us and it's just time to move forward in confidence and it's time to stop letting him take you from all that God intends to give you. We're in a battle. Satan is the enemy. And you're a warrior all the time. All the time. I think it's important to note that Revelation and Zechariah both use the phrase day and night. Day and night. Satan accuses us and attacks us day and night. Many warriors have commented on the intensity of battle and warfare. And um, I think it's interesting, you know, to talk with my friends who are veterans. They share about how hard battle has been in life and, you know, how it's, it never relents. And I think that many of us don't realize that following Jesus is a battle. It's a battle. It's a battle. It's 
You know, Satan is accusing us day and night, but we don't fight him day and night. I think a lot of Christians struggle with this because um, I think a lot of us view Jesus as like a spiritual diet. He's like here to get rid of your, your spiritual muffin top. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's, he's good for a diet. He's a good workout. He's gonna help me deal with this thing. And you know, I'm gonna work out uh, spiritually Sunday through you know, Thursday, but Friday and Saturday, I just deserve a little cheat day. I just deserve a little bit. You know, I'll just do whatever I want. Cause, uh, and following Jesus is not a diet. It's a battle. I think some of us need to shift our mentality. It's a permanent thing. It's a lifelong thing especially during the COVID shutdown, I think a lot of us took a break, took some time off. I think a lot of us have allowed the voice of the accuser to run rampant up in here. The world's out of control, right? That's what we start believing. Everything's doomed. I mean, we have the, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus alive inside of us. We have his promises for um, a hope in, for eternity. And yet all of us, we look at the world and feel doomed. It's like, how would we feel doomed as Christians? How can we look at this and say, oh, you know, it's the end. Of the-. It's not. God wins. We're good. But some of us, oh, politically things are over and the climate's going crazy in the Supreme Court. You know, you got to know about the Supreme Court, John, and you got to, it's this, and they're going to do this, and he's going to do that, and this is going to happen in the COVID, John, the COVID, and it's this, and it's that, and we're not taking it serious enough. We're taking it too serious, and it's the end of, listen, for so many of us, we follow Jesus for, for weeks or months or years or decades or a lifetime, and then basically we sort of, um, we sort of just stop fighting. We just took a cheat day. We let the enemy cross the lines into our house and burn down what God has been building in our hearts. And I'm like, hey guys, it's time to fight. Again, you're a warrior. No wonder why our heads are messed up because we abandon the front lines, we let the accuser in, but we're in a spiritual battle, Satan's the enemy, and it's time for us to say, Lord, I'm fighting again, I'm ready. I'm picking up the sword, I'm ready to go. We're in a spiritual battle, Satan's the enemy. You're a warrior all the time. Fourth point, we fight together, we fight together. It's amazing to me how much the modern church has focused on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship. Choosing to follow Jesus is a personal decision that you make in your own heart. And that's true. When you become a Christian, that's a big deal. It's a personal decision. You do cho- choose to follow Jesus, but it's, it's a so that. And I like to view it like this. Um, putting on your football equipment is a private thing. I mean, Shane, at least I hope it is. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need your help. I'm going to do it myself. You know, I'll put all that stuff on and, you know, I don't need, I don't need you, you know, um, to do that because that's weird. I'm going to put on my football equipment by myself, right? But it's a so that, so that I get out there and play as a team, right? I mean, it's a so that. And, and of course, of course, you put on your pads so that you can go out on the field and play as a team. And so it is with Christianity. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, suit up. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take out the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, right? He's got a really elaborate description of all the armor. Pray in the spirit at all times. Day and night on every occasion, right? Fight the devil all the time. You're a warrior all the time. Of course, thanks for reinforcing my point, Paul. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. What is he saying? We suit up so that we can fight as a team. So that we can fight as a team. And um, I think it's interesting because for a lot of us, I feel like we miss, we miss a so that, you know? I think for a lot of us, um, we miss this little part right here and, and, and we just start thinking, well, you know, I don't understand why I need to go to a church to believe in God. I don't need to go to church and listen, what's the difference, you know? I mean, some dude talking about Jesus, whatever. I can believe in God at home. I can read my Bible at home. I don't need to go. It's like, have you read the Bible? Like, have you literally read the Bible? He literally says, don't give up meeting together as some people have. Like, this meeting together thing is really important. And here's why. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus summarizes all of the Old Testament and all of the New Testament. And he scrunches down the Ten Commandments into one commandment. And he says, a new commandment I give to you. One commandment, Troy. It's just one. Love one another. In the same way that I've loved you, so you must love one another. This is it. It's following Jesus. Love God, love people. So simple. So many of us, we forget that. Following Jesus is a team sport. We forget that we fight together. And yet, sadly, this is how we silence the accuser in our lives. This is so often how we grow in our faith. We do this together. This is the most effective weapon that we have. You know, we just played this... um, baptism and profession video at church. I don't know if you guys remember that. David did a great job. And we had like, I don't know, 17 or 20 people making baptism and profession. And you know, they all came in and some of them were baptized. All of them profess their faith. And uh, I asked them a series of questions. And one of the questions I asked is, is why? Why are you joining the church, Dave? And, 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 you know, in my heart of hearts, I was like, I mean, hopefully one of them 
maybe two or three, Steve, is going to say, I'm joining the church because the messages were just so good. You know what I mean? Like, maybe just a little vain part of me. And you know what? Like, almost none of them mentioned it. Like, one of them was like a side thing. Like, yeah, I mean, the messages are okay. okay. But other than that, it was, it was all, like, for the people. It's because of the people. It's because the people of God showed us who Jesus was, right? And here's the thing. The church isn't about a pastor preaching a message. It's about the people of God doing the work of God for the glory of God. Church isn't the message. It's not the music. It's the community. This is what changes lives and hearts. And I think that so many of us are struggling in our faith. And I see this wave of doubt that um, I've never seen before. It has nothing to do with evidence. Like, we have so much evidence. It's not evidence. Like, if, if you know physics, like, we know that God is real. It's just silliness to deny that. It's, it's relationship. That's the issue they were dealing with, Dakota. That's the problem that we're facing. It's relationship. And I think it's because we stop playing together as a team. And I want to say it's time for us to get back together. Back to church. Back to volunteering. Into life groups. It's life group Sunday. Right? This is a chance for you to say, hey, I want to, I want to be. A life group is a community that meets um, once a week, once a month. Um, to challenge us to grow in our faith. To build community. To build relationships. To fight the voice of the accuser. There's meaning. And I think in society, like, relationships are something that are, that are dying. Like, actually knowing other people, friendship, like, it's dying. Like, having friendships that endure, um, it's, a, it's a skill. It's an art that needs to be developed, that must be pursued intentionally. I think it's time for us to say, I want back. We got some issues, you know. We are in a spiritual battle. And Satan is the enemy. Some of us got that voice of the accuser going crazy. I want to tell you, you're, you're a warrior. And maybe some of you needed to hear this, but it, it's time to fight together. It's time to stand together. It's time to do this together. It's a big deal. Now, my last point is, is a good point. Um, at least knows I preached to my wife on, on Tuesday nights, and I failed this week, big time. I preached to her, and she said, that is the worst message. you got to rewrite it. So I rewrote it, and um, I like the last point that I got the second time I rewrote it. It's a good point. It's a really good point. So good. Um, I want to close with it, and I want to ask you guys to stand before I reveal this to you. It's a big deal. This point spoke to me this week. And I think it'll speak to you. And it's not gonna seem like that big a deal right now, but like a pastor, I gotta explain it to you. I gotta tell you what it is, but here's the deal. Um, Christ brings us victory. Christ brings us victory. One of the big determiners of an army's success is something called troop morale. Troop morale, it's a big deal, it's a big deal. Um, and a troop morale can cause a small, outnumbered, outgunned, outmatched force to defeat vastly larger forces. And um, morale is actually determined by faith in a cause, two things, faith in a cause and belief in an eventual victory. And first off, you gotta believe in the cause, right? This is why mercenaries, paid soldiers to fight, they don't, they don't actually do that well, right? Because so often it's just money, they don't really believe in the cause, and the cause of money, it's not that motivating, right? Um, but you gotta believe in the cause. And then number two, um, you really gotta believe that you're gonna win, that you can win, that, that not all hope is lost. So you're saying there's a chance, right? You gotta believe it. And uh, morale is, is what's called a force multiplier. Right? It's not a force additive. It doesn't make your army like perform like a few people are added. It can multiply, multiply the effectiveness of your troops. A lot of research has been done on, on POWs who have survived, concentration camp survivors, and armies that defeat larger forces. And, and the question is continually asked, why? Why did they succeed? What allowed them to win? And um, this, is, this is really interesting because it's, it's always the ones who believed in their cause and believed that they could win. And not a silly, optimistic belief like, oh yeah, we'll be out of the COVID pandemic by the end of September. We'll have a vaccine and we'll be, no, 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 no. It's facing the brutal facts of your present reality, no matter how difficult they are. And say, even in the midst of it all, I face it, I'm dealing with it. I'm not, I'm not being silly. I'm not being superstitious. I'm dealing with the problems. I'm carrying the mantle. And I still believe that we're going to overcome this. That's the kind of belief we're talking about here. This matters. And we're going to prevail against this. And um, here's the thing. This is what I want you to know. I think that the Christians are dealing with some morale issues right now. I think Christians are dealing with, with some, some morale issues, some self-esteem issues, Nick. I think a lot of us have forgotten some of the promises of God in our life. And I think that a lot of us, it, it's gotten dark and we're like, oh, pastor, politics and, and, and you know, the, 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 the elections and, and all these issues and, and, and my 401ks and it's just so scary right now. And have we forgotten that God wins in the end? Have we forgotten that God rips open the sky at the end of days and every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord? 
Have we forgotten that we stand in heaven with Jesus and we look upon his face and we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts? Have we forgotten the promises of God in our life that remove the sting of death and the victory of death? I just want to read to you this passage that I think is moving to me. You know, it describes some stuff that speaks to me. Hold on, I want this TV. Just give me a second. Give me a second, guys. I want this TV. After I've done this verse, you can take it away. But it says um, in Isaiah 54, 17, but in that coming day, in that coming day, when Jesus returns, no weapon turned against you will succeed. And first off, praise God, right? There ain't no weapon that can succeed. There ain't nothing that's gonna defeat us in that coming day. Not yet, there's still stuff that hurts, but someday, I mean, we'll be like, we'll have a star in, in Mario Brothers, you know what I mean? Like, it can't touch us. And you will silence every voice. And this is the part that really gets me. This is the part that makes me emotional. You will silence every voice raised up to accuse you. Oh man, I can't wait for that day. It's not, I rebuke you. It's not like, I'm not gonna hear that. I'm not gonna listen to that. It's that the voices are silenced. It's that the voice of the devil is silenced. And I don't need to hear that stuff anymore because Jesus will defeat Satan. And I don't need to hear the voice of the accuser. His voice is silenced. These benefits are enjoyed by the servants of the Lord. That's our inheritance. That's his promise in our life. And then this is a big one here that some of us need to hear. It says, their vindication will come from me, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our vindicator. He's our savior. It's not a political outcome. It's not an economic outcome. It is Jesus Christ crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected for our sins. And he says, I, the Lord, have spoken. That's it. It's done. It's sealed. Now I can take that away. I want to remind you of some things, church. I want you to hear this. And this is real, Rich. Maybe this is for you today. We're in a battle. And that's scary. Right? It's scary. We have an enemy. And that's scary. But you're a warrior. God made you to fight and made you to win and made you to conquer. So maybe it's time to take the land back. And I want you to hear this one too. We fight together. We're in this together. We're a team. We're doing this together. And I want you to hear this last part. This is the best part. We are going to win. Christ wins. Christ wins. He rolls again. The victory is sealed. The deed is done. Our sins have been redeemed. Pray with me, Jesus. We thank you for your victory. We receive your victory. Spirit, fall afresh on us. God, do great things in and through us. We won't walk in fear. 